We have an expression that we use when somebody shows up unexpectedly, when we meet someone we've wanted to meet or haven't met in a long time. Sometimes we find ourselves saying, look who's here. And that's my subject, and I don't mean me, and I don't mean you either. It could be used often in the Bible. Look who's here. For instance, the Israelites in the wilderness, pilgrims and strangers with Egypt behind them and the promised land ahead of them, tempted to despair and even to rebellion, but God was with them, and on many a night a discouraged Hebrew could pull open the flap to the tent and see that pillar of fire way up in the sky and turn to his companion and say, everything's all right. God's with us. Look who's here. And then there was uh, Daniel. You remember that they teamed up on his devotional life, and Darius threw him into the lion's den. But Daniel wasn't the one who couldn't sleep that night. That was Darius. He was a mighty emperor, but he couldn't sleep. He lived in a magnificent palace, but he couldn't sleep. His bed was covered with the rarest of tapestries, but he couldn't sleep. And so he got up and took off next morning, bleary-eyed, bright and early, or at least early, down to the lion's den and called in and said, Daniel, how are you doing? And Daniel said, Your Majesty, you might as well have got your rest, because God sent his angel here and millennialized all these old lions. And I laid my head on the main one of them, slept just fine because the angel of the Lord was here. Look who's here. I didn't need my salmon eggs at all because the Lord took care of the situation completely. And then there were the three Hebrew children that uh, Nebuchadnezzar cast into the fiery furnace. And then he looked in and said, something strange happened here. I threw in three and I see four. What's going on here? And they might well have said, well... We have company. One likened to the Son of God is walking around with us. Look who's here. Now, God can keep you from the furnace, and he can keep you in the furnace. But I like this little extra note that the Holy Spirit threw out here. It says that when they came out, and the only thing that was burned was the cords that bound them. Everything else survived the fire except those cords. And the Bible says there was not even the smell of the smoke upon them. Now, why was that thrown in there? Well, the trouble with some of these people who suffer for Jesus, you never hear the last of it. And all the rest of their lives, they're telling you what martyrs they've been for Jesus. If you ever do get in a fiery furnace, ask God to take away the smell of the smoke so that you don't come out bragging about it or moaning about it all the rest of your days. And then there was Elijah on Carmel. There'd been a drought. It had rained on neither the just nor the unjust. And there was a confrontation on earth because before there was ever an intervention from heaven. And that's the way revival always works. First the showdown and then the showers. Elijah repaired the altar and prepared the sacrifice because it's useless to expect the fire from heaven when the altar has not been repaired and the sacrifice has not been prepared. And then he did something that I've never heard anybody preach about. He poured 12 barrels of water all over the sacrifice. Now, remember that water was just about the scarcest commodity in the neighborhood because there'd been a drought and there wasn't any water around. And yet Elijah wasted 12 barrels of precious water and made that sacrifice soggy so that if any fire fell, it would have to come from heaven. God uh, would have to do it. Some people today try to build a little fire so God won't have so much trouble. We try to warm up the older and help God out, but Elijah drenched it. And I've been saying up and down this country, it is the drenched altar that God sets on fire. When you've done the best you can and have made the sacrifice and repaired the altar, then as it were, douse the whole business and say before God, I count my richest gain but loss and pour contempt on all my pride in utter desperation. Have your organization and your study courses and your committees. We have to have committees, you know, a group of the unfit, appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. We have to have a committee. But after you've done all of that, then have the, everybody to stand and sing, Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Won't you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain 
unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. We need, I hate to recommend one more committee even, but I think we need one today, by and large, in the churches of America, and that's a water pouring committee. After everything else has been done, say, now nothing's going to happen yet unless we acknowledge that we are utterly unable to do it ourselves. It was when Elijah drenched the altar and then asked God to set fire to it that the miracle happened, and if it hadn't, Elijah would have been the laughing stock of the whole country. When we are prepared to be called fools for Christ's sake and risk everything on God, the fire falls. And remember that if you are believing something and preaching something and living something that this world calls foolishness, and that's what Paul said they call the gospel, moronic is the word. That's where you get the word moron. The world calls the gospel foolishness, and if you believe it and live it automatically and logically, that will make you to the world a fool. There's no way around it. They go together. You've got to get into something before God intervenes. The average church member's not giving the devil enough trouble to even get his attention. The devil's not going to do anything. He's not going to bother you if you're not bothering him. But let a man start out in dead earnest to live for God and something happens. We forget that the wind blows where it wants to, where it listeth, and he's not operated by clockwork. But when we set things up so that nothing happens unless God does it, God will do it. And when he comes down, the multitude will say, Look who's here. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then there was Elisha, that prophet of God. He was a good man to have around. He was equal to any situation. He could supply the city with good drinking water. He could recover lost axe heads. He could make poison food fit to eat. He could put a poor widow in the oil business at a profit. He could heal lepers and raise the dead. And he was also a one-man built-in CIA. He was a central intelligence system because when the king of Syria tried to make a move, old Elisha had a hotline to heaven and heard about it first. And the king said, we've got to get that preacher. We can't get anything done. So they sent the army after him. Maybe we need some preachers. They send the militia after him once in a while. And Elisha's servant came out that morning and looked, and there were soldiers to the right of him and soldiers to the left of him. Here a soldier, there a soldier, everywhere a soldier. And he ran back in and said, They've got us this time. We're surrounded. And when Elisha said, there be more with us than they that be with them. And that servant must have said, Well, I don't see them. Where are they? But even the statistics are on the side of the Christian. Do you know that? We're always lamenting the statistics. But all the children in heaven are on our side. All the saints are on our side. All the angels are on our side. That's a pretty good aggregation. Even the statistics are on our side. And then Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. And God did, and when he saw, he looked up and saw angels to the right of him and angels to the left of him. Here an angel, there an angel, everywhere an angel, because the angel of the Lord was encamping round about them that feared him to deliver them. And that'll happen if you look up and don't look down. God help you if you go by what you read in the papers and see on television news reports today. We need to have our glasses cleared up. You can't be optimistic with a misty optic. You've got to get your eyes open. I know the outlook's bad and the down looks worse, but thank God there's the upper. I have a preacher friend who says, every time I hear Walter Cronkite saying, that's the way it is, I feel like saying, no, no, Walter. That's not the way it is. That's just the way it looks. I think he's right. And sometimes when I'm out walking, and I walk an awful lot, I find myself reciting those immortal lines of James Russell Lowell. Careless seems the great avenger. And sometimes it does seem that God doesn't care much about what happens to us. It looks that way sometimes. Careless seems the great avenger. History's pages but record. One death grapple in the darkness twixt old systems and the word. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. That's the way it looks. But that's not the way it is. Because the rest of the poem says, but that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. That's the way it is, my friend. 
And we'd better find out the difference here. That scaffold does sway the future. And then there was Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Now the death of Uzziah was a national calamity. He'd been a good king, but my Bible says when he was strong, not when he was weak, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Paul was strong when he was weak, but Uzziah was weak when he was strong. And he usurped the office of priest and tried to offer incense in the temple. And God struck him with leprosy and he died in disgrace. And everybody was overwhelmed and people were saying, if a good man like Uzziah can end up like that, what hope is there for the rest of us? And Isaiah, that great patrician prophet, was stunned himself. But for him, while everybody else was moaning the loss, the minus, he had a plus. In the year that King Uzziah died, the big minus, I saw also the Lord. That was the plus. Now, may the Lord bring you to the place where when some great loss comes in your life and in your experience, you'll see also the Lord. Everybody else saw the disaster and the despair that gripped the country. And they said, Isaiah's gone, but Isaiah saw that God wasn't gone. I read in Hebrews, we see not yet all things but under him. But we see Jesus. It's uh, uh, a marvelous statement of the fact that you mustn't go by what you see around you. In front of the Washington Depot, we don't ride the trains anymore, but I guess it's still up there, carved this inscription about fire, the greatest of discoveries, electricity, the carrier of light and power, and then under all that, thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, I don't know whether the man who carved that knew what that meant, whether he understood it to mean man or the son of man or whatever, one thing is true. It certainly doesn't look tonight as though all things were under Jesus, but we see Jesus. We're in the worst mess we've ever been in since Adam and Eve ate us out of house and home in the Garden of Eden. We're in a bad way tonight, but get your eyes up and see that God is still on the throne. The greatest hero that America had in the last quarter of a century and more was Lindbergh. Somebody says one reason that youth is suffering today is because they don't have a hero. There are celebrities and stars and what have you. But Lindy was just about the last hero. Now, the fellows who went to the moon, that was a far more complicated task indeed. But nobody remembers their names for some reason. But when Lindy sat down in that old, uh, uh, that little plane, no radio, no nothing, and took off for Paris, he'd better have something. And he had it. And the whole world was at his feet. Even Calvin Coolidge got excited. And you know you'd have to do something pretty remarkable to get Cal stirred up. And the whole world was at the feet of Charles A. Lindbergh. And then trouble began to fall. And they kidnapped and murdered his baby boy. And he became so weary of the adulation of the multitude. Moved over to England to live. And went over to Germany and got tangled up with the Nazis. And Franklin D. Roosevelt said that he was a traitor, but Eisenhower promoted him. And during World War II, he served in a sort of a, uh, advisory capacity, although some in active service. Then he found out he had a terminal illness after he had espoused the cause of uh, conservation. <clears throat> he planned his own funeral. And they buried him in a very plain grave in Hawaii in a fatigue outfit. I don't think he was even embalmed. And on the tombstone, these words, Though I mount up with the wings of the morning. I don't know what Lindbergh meant by that, but here is a confession that he made. I have lived to see the science that I worship and the aircraft that I loved destroying the civilization I expected them to serve. That's a sad finish. But in the midst of all this modern Tower of Babel that's going to become the Babylon of Revelation, although we see not yet all things put under him, we do see Jesus. Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Look who's here. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Look who's here. John the Baptist said, There standeth one among you whom you know not. Look who's here. Every Sunday morning when a preacher stands in the pulpit, he's saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. Look who's here. Peter and John in the temple uh, said to the lame man, look on us. They didn't mean look at us, what big preachers we are. 
They meant we represent somebody you can't see. There was a lameness, there was a look, there was a lift, and there was a leap. Uh, you remember that the man who came in limping went out leaping. No wonder Charles Wesley wrote that verse in over a thousand tongues. I don't know why we don't have it in our hymnal. But the one I like best isn't in there. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior, come and leap, ye lame. For Joe. I don't know whether they were afraid some Baptist would take that literally. But knowing Baptists like I do, I don't think there's the remotest danger of them doing it. Every meeting that we have ought to shout to this old world, look who's here. Not our church, not our preacher, not our choir, not us. There's somebody else here because he said he'd be every time we meet in his name. And we meet in vain if we don't see him. I've heard of a church where they had a picture of Jesus back of the pulpit. And when the minister rose of a Sunday morning, he uh, partly obscured that picture. One Sunday the preacher was a little late getting there and a the little girl asked her mother, Mama, where is the man who stands so you can't see Jesus? You can do that. A preacher can do that. You can do that teaching the Sunday school class. You can get in the way of Jesus. And when Jesus was on earth, he stopped at Jacob's well and talked to a poor wicked woman about the water of life. And she said, well, you don't have anything to draw with, and it's a deep well. Now, she was right in the facts, but wrong in the conclusion. She didn't know who was there. What difference does it make if the well is deep and there's nothing to draw with if you're in the presence of Jesus Christ? Look who's here. And at Bethany, you remember, when Jesus finally came down there, Lazarus was sick, and they sent an SOS call, He whom thou lovest is sick. And the Bible says that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And it doesn't say because he loved him, he hurried down there as fast as he could go. It says he abode two days where he was. Did you ever pray and it looked like God took his own good time? Wasn't in any hurry to get to you at all. And then when Jesus got down to Bethany, Martha was kind of out of sorts. If you'd been here, she said this wouldn't have happened. Now, she was right in the facts, wrong in the conclusion. He was dead, but something greater was about to happen. He was to be raised from the dead. She was, uh, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She said, I know he will at the resurrection. Now, once again, she was right in the facts and wrong in the conclusion. She was a good fundamentalist. But it wasn't doing her much good that day. But you don't have to wait till the resurrection to see your brother live again. Uh, that occasion proved right there standing beside her. She said, I know he'll rise at the resurrection. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection primarily is not a doctrine, it's somebody. And this is Easter. And it means that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Look who's here. And then when they got down to the grave, he said, roll the stone away from the sepulchre. Martha spoke up again. He said, well, he's been dead four days. If we roll that stone away, it'll create an unpleasant situation. Now, she was right in the facts, but wrong in the conclusion. Look who's there. What does it matter if he's been dead six months? If you have the Son of God standing there. And at the house of Jairus, Jesus said, the little girl's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed him to scorn knowing that she was dead, right in the facts, wrong in the conclusion. And that's as far as atheism and agnosticism and unbelief ever get. She's dead, and that ends it. When you're dead, you're dead. They'd already met Jairus in the house and said, Thy daughter is dead. Why trouble the master any further? Did you ever pray and got no answer? And the devil said, Why bother God any more about it? God's got a whole universe to look after. How can he be bothered with you? Well, it, this amounts to that. But when Jesus Christ is there, death doesn't have the last word. Look who's here. When he's here, all the conclusions of mortal men fall short. No wonder they put that crowd out of the room. <clears throat> you don't need a bunch like that around when you're getting ready to raise the dead. My Bible tells me that in the last days, there will be scoffers who will say, where is the promise of his coming? We have arrived, my friend. They're all around. They say there's nothing but natural law, cause and effect. God's nowhere. We ought to take that nowhere and cut it in two and make it read now here. God is now here. Look who's here. He's among us. It isn't just natural law. God breaks through once in a while. 
I was out at Southwestern Seminary some time ago talking to those boys. We had a great time that morning, and I said, whenever you see scoffers who say there is no sign of the Lord's return, you have just seen another sign. That's what the Bible says. He's an animated placard moving around advertising the very thing he denied. And then Jesus took a nap on the Sea of Galilee, and a storm came up. And the disciples forgot that the Son of God was having a nap in the boat. And they woke him up, carest thou not that we perish. They forgot who was there. And God gave Adam dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea. But he never gave him dominion over the wind and the water. I was with Dr. Francisco of Louisville Seminary in the conference some time ago when he made this plain as I had never seen it, and I felt like going away from there with one foot saying amen and the other hallelujah, because he said, God gave Adam control over the birds and the bees and the fish, but never gave him control over wind and water. But that day, they had a man with them in the boat who was taking a nap. And the wind and the water got together and stirred up a storm. And then that man stood up and said, Be still. And those old disciples must have said, Look who's here. Must be a new Adam. The old Adam couldn't handle it. And they said, What manner of man is this, <clears throat> that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, I believe if we could ever get around to believing all this, we're so used to it, we Americans. We go to church all the time. We've heard it all our lives. Do you realize that if you were in some parts of this world and they heard it for the first time, I don't know whether they'd go home tonight or not. I know some missionaries that, about some missionaries in Korea who preached, and then they said, now you folks must go and get your rest. The meeting's over, but they wouldn't leave. And the missionary said, but the meeting is over. And they said, we can't go. You've told us that God so loved the world that he gave his son. If we'll believe him, we'll live forever. Who can sleep? My soul, we go to sleep listening to it. <clears throat> it's about time somebody woke up to the reality of all this. I thank God that I can stand in any storm and say, so what? Look who's here. And then one day they had a crowd and nothing to eat. And Jesus said, how are we going to feed this crowd? The Bible says he knew he wasn't stumped. Jesus was never stumped. He knew what he was going to do. How are we going to get a, uh, food for this crowd? And Philip got out his little notebook and started figuring. 200 penny worth of bread wouldn't do. Doesn't that just sound like the chairman of the finance committee? <laughs> Sound like a Southern Baptist making an estimate. Exactly. And Jesus said to him, in effect, we don't need a budget. We need a boy with a few loaves and fishes. That's all we need. Look who's here, Philip. I'm not stumped because several thousand people out there have nothing to eat. No problem ever stumped him. After the resurrection, he stood on the shore and the disciples didn't know him. And they'd fished all night and hadn't caught a thing. That's one fish tale, I believe. <clears throat> Somebody said the only time a fisherman tells the truth is when he calls another fisherman a liar. <laughs> well, they had fished all night and hadn't caught a thing. And the Son of God with only 40 days to walk around down here, and that gets me every time I think over it. Why didn't my Lord, after this Easter resurrection, why didn't he go to Herod and Pilate and say, all right, you folks, you got me, here I am. Why, he could have gone to Athens and Rome and Alexandria all over the world, the only man who ever died and came back. Instead of that, nobody ever saw him except his own. And we are members of the greatest secret order on earth because we've got a secret. The only difference is we ought to be telling it all the time. And... Uh, Jesus took time out. And he was always like that. You see, God didn't do it like we would have done it if we'd set up the plan of salvation. Baby born in a barn, cradled in a manger, a carpenter for 30 years of all things. And then he has only three years left. Now he has only 40 days left. 
and he can take time out to cheer up a poor weeping woman by the sepulchre. Or two lonely believers going down that Emmaus road, <clears throat> and they said, well, I guess there wasn't anything to it. We trusted it had been he we should have redeemed Israel, and uh, besides, it's the third day. And because it was the third day, they ought to have gone down the road saying, hallelujah, we're liable to run into him anyhow, anywhere. And not only that, they were walking right beside him. Look who's here. And so here, he said, throw out your net and you will catch fish. Taking time out to tell some fishermen how to fish. And no wonder John said to Peter, look who's here. It is the Lord. Now you run all this through again and what have you got? Nothing to draw with and the well is deep. So what? Look who's here. My brother arise, so what? Look who's here now. He's been dead four days, so what? Look who's here. They laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead, so what? Look who's here. We fished all night and haven't caught anything, so what? Look who's here. Two hundred penny worth of bread wouldn't do it, so what? Look who's here. And those Emmaus disciples didn't realize that there was one beside them who... If they'd give him a little time, and they did, they said, come in and stay with us. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. Abide with me, fast falls the even time. And he was made noon in the breaking of the bread. And old Alexander White, the great Scotsman, said, I, I think they recognized him then because they saw the prince of the nails when he broke the bread. I don't know, but it's a wonderful thought. Anyway, look who's here. But we live in a glass house, friends, and we can't throw stones. He said, where two or three gather in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I wonder what would happen in the average Wednesday night prayer meeting if we ever took that seriously, that Jesus Christ is there and he's here right now in this Sunday evening service. We've heard it too much, maybe. You think you could re-gear your mind a bit and be as though you never heard it? Some of you old folks probably remember Billy Sunday, and he used to take off on the weekly W-E-A-K-L-Y weekly prayer meeting. Oh, he said it's pitiful. He said to get there 15 minutes late to start with, nobody to play the piano, and then some dear sister feels moved upon finally to play the piano. Takes her about 10 minutes to find the hymn and fix the bench. And then they all stand up and sing, throw out the lifeline. They haven't got strength enough to put up a clothesline. And then the leader gets up and says, uh, I'm sorry, friends, but I didn't take time to prepare anything. He said, didn't need to have said that. You could tell he hadn't prepared anything. Then they stand up and sing, days dying in the west. He said, that's not the only thing dying around in that part of the country. When I hear people apologize to the slim crowd by saying, well, the Bible says we're two or three together. Well, thank God it does. But sometimes I'm afraid they're more conscious of the absence of the people than they are of the presence of the Lord. I hear deacons sometimes, Lord, be with us in this service. Friend, he is there. He's there already. I haven't asked God to be with us in a meeting in 25 years. Now, I suppose they mean make us aware of thy presence and make us conscious of thy presence, but let's get it straight. Evan Roberts was used so mightily of God in the great Welsh revival. Just a boy out of the mind. There were big preachers in those days, but God didn't use any of them. Campbell Morgan came to the revival and sat back there in the crowd. Gypsy Smith sat back in the crowd. Commander Booth of the Salvation Army sat back in the crowd. They didn't need big preachers. They had God. And I wonder sometimes if some of these days when we get completely worn out trying to make revivals, packing the pew, banana bunches, Pin the tail on the donkey, talking horses, karate experts, theatrical personalities, expose and explodes and extravaganzas. Maybe God will say, you've had it long enough, I'm going to take over. And we'll quit worrying so about the drop in baptisms last year. These computerized statistics and charts and diagrams and percentages that boggle your mind. And these discussions, you know, these uh, uh, moratoriums, I call them, symposiums, the big word for it, that means where we pool our ignorance. And we get together in a symposium 
Oh, the baptisms are down. What in the world are we going to do? I feel like getting up in the middle of the crowd and saying, Look who's here. Jesus Christ is around yet. Maybe if we could see that, we wouldn't worry so much about buildings and buses and budgets and baptisms. We've already got what we need. The question is, has he got us? All authority is given to him, heaven and earth. Do you believe it? All things delivered unto me of my Father. Do we believe it? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in me. Do, do you believe it? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily in him. Do you believe it? How many meetings have you been in? And we're on the spot again tonight. And I check on it once in a while. How many meetings have I been in in the last year where when I walked out, the thing that impressed me was God was there? How many of you have been in that? That's what you thought about when you went out. That's the way it ought to be. Jesus is all we need. Look who's here. But if we ever get around to seeing that, it'll turn out a brand new crowd of Christians that have not just taken the step, but they've taken the walk. We've got lots of people who have taken the step. I took the step 25 years ago, and they haven't moved since. Got stuck on the first step. They have moved. Stepping in the light. Walking in light and love. You don't have to wear a great big button that says I'm a Christian. Carry a Bible as big as a series and rule book catalog. Let everybody know you got it. Just go around with your heart singing, I walk with the king. Hallelujah. I walk with the king. Praise his name. No longer I roam my soul faces home. I walk and I talk with the king. I like that trio a while ago about that we ought to get the word out. We ought to get the message out. I had a friend in Greensboro, Dr. Raymond Taylor. He was a dean of the drama department at the university across the street from where I live. There's a building named for him. He's a Harvard man, brilliant, so versed in literature. But for 70-odd years, he didn't know Jesus. And his wife prayed for 45 years that he'd be saved. And one night, he was. And we became cronies, and we'd go out and eat every week or so and talk. He liked to write, and I liked to try to write, and we'd swap notes and talk. A brand-new Christian at 76 or 7 years of age. And he was like a kid with a new toy. He wanted to go everywhere bragging on Jesus Christ. He didn't care what church. He didn't know the difference, and that's a pretty good thing. Maybe some, you know, the happiest fellow in this world is a brand new Christian before he's met too many Bible scholars. He didn't know any better than to believe the Bible and believe Jesus. <clears throat> He'd read it all these years as literature. And I said to him, Doctor, how did it happen? Did you hear a sermon? No. Had you been to church? No, I didn't go to church. How did it happen? He said, God woke me up in the middle of the night and showed me what a lost old sinner I was. Now, I think his wife praying had a lot to do with that, too. He came down the steps next morning and said, I'm going to church with you. And she'd prayed for 45 years, but uh, she almost got upset. But that, it was all so sudden, you know. And then this is the thing that threw me. And it fits in with what I'm talking about. Somebody ought to tell it. I said, Doctor, in all those years that you were an infidel, did anybody ever speak to you about Jesus? No. You mean nobody? No. No wonder God visited him at midnight. Nobody else would. The other day, at the evangelistic conference, I was telling about a fellow who was an old sinner all his days. He was lying quite ill, and probably at the door of death. And he had a friend. They'd worked together for years and years. And the friend visited him. And this man said to him, uh, You claim to be a Christian, don't you? Oh, yes, oh, yes. I'm a church man. And that dying man said, I don't believe you're a Christian. 
that you and I have known each other all these years. You have shared everything with me. You always showed me the picture of the wife and the kids and <clears throat> told me about your trips and your hobbies and your friends all these years. Now, I said if Jesus Christ is as wonderful as they say he is, and if he's as wonderful to people as they say he is, you couldn't have kept that to yourself all those years. And if he's so wonderful, why didn't you introduce me to him? That'll do to think of it. That ought to put all of us on our faces before God. Oh, I think of old Bob Ligger when I was pastor of the old First Baptist Church at Charleston. Ligger was a drunk. His family is about to break up. Somebody got him to come down to the old church. He came several nights, and then one night I took out after him. And I said, don't you think you ought to do something about this? Yes, I do. I went to the prayer room, and he put an arm around my neck and said, preacher, pray for me. I said, I will, and you pray for yourself, and God saved him. Oh, he got a double dose of it. Talk about second blessing. He had tenth blessing, hundredth blessing. He had all of them at once. Double dose. One time, Merv Roselle was with me in a meeting playing his saxophone and speaking. And uh, the phone rang at 2 in the morning with my friend Ligger at the other end of the line. He said, i got a sailor over here, and I'm afraid I won't tell him straight how to get saved. Could you fellas come over? Now, my evangelistic zeal was a little low at 2 in the morning. But Merv and I got out of bed and stumbled down the steps with one eye shut and the other and going out of business and went over there to his room. He had this sailor down, several people trying to tell him how to get saved, and all of them telling him different, some saying turn loose, and others telling him to hold on. And no wonder he didn't get saved. <clears throat> and I tried to tell him, and uh, I didn't think he knew what he was doing. I thought he was drunk or doped or both, but he had more sense than I thought. When I started out, he raised up and said, Lord, help this preacher to believe I mean business. I'd gone over there to pray for him. He had to pray for me. You talk about a man, though, that had a real experience of Jesus Christ. He hung on to his cigarettes a few weeks. And I said, I'd see you coming down the street, and that cigarette got big as a baseball bat. <clears throat> said he couldn't swallow the thing. I didn't know what to do with it. And the Lord took care of that, too. But, my friend, somebody ought to tell somebody. And they have a right to say you're a liar. If after all these years, Jesus hasn't made that much difference to us. And finally, one of these days, it may be at morn when the day is awakened. It may be at midday. It may be at twilight. It may be perchance in the blackness of midnight that God is going to put on a demonstration that will make all our pageants look like kindergarten operettas. The trumpet will sound. The angels and the saints will get together in a host innumerable. And everybody who's ready for that great getting up morning will put on their sure enough Easter outfits. And the saints will go marching home to the biggest family reunion in all history with their troubles all over and their questions all answered and their tears all wiped away. And I believe it'll all be summed up in one mighty shout I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't hear it clear around the world. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Look who's here.